Luke chapter 5, and uh, I think everyone has these. Uh, I already gave most of you the first list, the first uh, 19 events. Uh, I think most of you already had this, and then tonight uh, I went ahead and gave you the second sheet. The last two events are the events we'll be covering tonight, verses 40 and 41. Uh, but these are the events of the chronological life of Jesus. And if you hang on to these, I encourage you, hang on to these because you'll always have a chronological record from start to finish of, of his personal life and ministry. And that way you can always use this as a resource. So uh, tonight we will pick up with uh, verses, or I'm sorry, events 40 and 41. Uh, but before we get into that, let's just do a quick recap. Last week we opened up with event number 38. We're about halfway through the Lord's ministry now, maybe a little bit shy of half, uh, 15 months thereabouts. He's carrying out, carrying out ministry in Capernaum. And to give you an idea of where Capernaum was, uh, it was located northeast of Nazareth. Nazareth is way, in fact, I've got a map. I don't know if you can see it or not with that glare, but right here is Nazareth where Jesus grew up. Uh, here's Jericho, Jerusalem, Judea, down in this area. Galilee and Capernaum is up in this area here. So Jesus has gone north uh, from Nazareth. Remember, this is where he was uh, basically rejected in his hometown just a few weeks prior to where we're at. And now he moves up into Galilee. And this was really where he spent the majority of his ministry. He would uh, travel south to Jerusalem every year to keep Passover. But for the most part, he spent his, the remainder of his time in Galilee. And so that's where he's at now. And uh, last week in event 38, uh, that is where we opened up with Jesus uh, teaching and by now the crowds have come out of the woodwork in such a way that they are pressed up against him. And it's virtually impossible for him to teach and preach in the open air now because the crowds are just, they're, they're swamped, okay? He, he's got people right here in front of him. So he takes advantage of a boat that belonged to Peter. And he would ask Peter to launch out just a little ways and that's where he would begin to teach from. And after he was finished with his discourse, he would ask Peter, along with James and John, and then we know they were all fishermen, he would ask them to launch out even deeper. And once they launched out, to cast down their nets. And they could not figure this out for the life of them because they had fished all night, the night before, caught nothing. And now that it's daytime, they're, they're definitely not going to catch anything because cast net fishing was only done primarily at night. When, when fish came to the surface to feed. During the day, fish are, you know, deep. The only way you would be successful during the daytime is if you had cut bait and you could throw it out, lure them up to the top of the water. And we see no evidence of that. But nonetheless, Peter says, at your word, we'll do it anyway. And so they did, and we, we read what happened. As soon as they dropped their nets, what happened? Their nets became full, so full uh, that this became a, a staggering miracle for these men. And it was really what brought Peter, James, and John to a level they've never seen before. Up to this point, they've seen Jesus perform a lot of miracles, right? Mm -hmm. But it's here where Peter drops to his knees and says, Lord, depart from me. I am a sinful man. Now, what was it that took 15 months for, for Peter to come to that place and position? Well, he truly now sees Jesus as the Son of God. Before, he saw him as the Messiah, miracle worker, all that. But Jesus now steps into their world, okay? Only they understood the gravity of this miracle. And this really brings them to a level they haven't seen before or witnessed. And really, this was what qualified Peter and the others for now becoming apostles. Uh, you're not qualified to be a Christian until you are aware you are a sinner in need of grace, right? You, yeah. you can't be saved until you come to the awareness that I'm lost, I'm undone, and I cannot save myself. I need a Savior. And that's pretty much where Peter was at. And so uh, from there, Jesus leaves the Sea of Galilee in between uh, events 38 and 39. 
And I think I told you this last week. Between these two events is where the Sermon on the Mount takes place. Uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, those three chapters. And then shortly after the Sermon on the Mount, according to Matthew chapter 8, Jesus is coming off the mountain back into Capernaum, and that's when a leper uh, receives him, comes to him. And that brings us to event 39, the last event that we dealt with. And this was the man, this was the first time Jesus deals with leprosy. And we know that leprosy was what? An incurable disease. disease. Okay, Once you attracted leprosy, that, that was it. There was no cure, uh, there was no medicine, no remedy. If you did receive healing, it was divine intervention. Mm -hmm. that, that was it. And so this man comes to Jesus. Uh, he's covered in leprosy, which was a flesh-eating disease, very painful. And you had to be self-quarantined away from all of society. You couldn't be around anyone. In fact, there was even a law given in Mosaic Law that said you, you had to stay distant from everyone. And so it would really bring about a very deprived depressing, lonely life, to be all alone. But then to add insult to injury, uh, there was this common belief that if you had leprosy, you was cursed by God, right? That's what mm -hmm. the overall thought was. If you had leprosy, well, you've done something wrong. And so it's one thing to be dealing with this physical pain, but then you had the emotional pain attached to it that not only said you had to stay away from people and, and live a life of solitude, but everyone thought you was cursed. No, no worse feeling than for people to think that you're cursed by God. You ever think about that? How bad that would, you know, if everyone around you just viewed you as being cursed by God. So the reason they believed that is because there were some scenarios in the Old Testament where God did curse people with leprosy. Miriam and uh, Aaron, the brother and sister of Moses, when they you know, got mad uh, with Moses for marrying an Ethiopian woman. God cursed him with leprosy. Uh, the servant of Elisha, who ran after Naaman and took the money when he wasn't supposed to. God struck him down with leprosy. And then finally, uh, King Uzziah, he's, he's king of Judah, and he takes it upon himself to go <coughs> to the temple and offer sacrifice. Who were the only ones allowed to offer sacrifice? Priests. Priests from the tribe of Levi. Levi, okay. And so the king, he obviously knew better. And when he goes in to perform sacrifice, even the priests try to warn him. And he refuses their warning. He moves through with it. And sure enough, God strikes him down with leprosy. Uh, but here in this event where Jesus will clean this leper, and we talked about this, the, the leper came to him. And if you look in chapter Luke chapter 5, verse 12, the, the man came to him and said, Lord, if you will. He doesn't say if you can. He doesn't say if you're able. He says, if you will, meaning I know you can. It's just a matter of if you will. And then look at the next verse where Jesus says, I will. See how quick that was? Jesus didn't ask a whole bunch of questions. He didn't try to get to know the man. He just simply said, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed. And I've been giving you these six marks to the Lord's healing ministry. And we actually find five out of the six right here with the leper. Number one, he healed according to his word, always. Every miracle Jesus performed was always according to his word. He spoke a word and then the miracle followed. Uh, number two, he would always concentrate primarily on incurable diseases. He really didn't put a lot of focus on, you know, stiff legs, sore backs, sprained ankles. No doubt he could deal with those. But Jesus focused on the blind, the deaf, uh, the lepers, those that were paralyzed. So he dealt with incurable diseases. Number three, he would heal instantly, just like he does here. Instantly, no waiting. Number four, he healed completely. There was no room for waiting for complete healing. There was no lingering side effects. It was always completed the moment he spoke the word. And then finally, number five, Jesus had no discrimination on whoever came to him. He was even known to heal his enemies. Remember, remember the guy that Peter whacks his ear off when they came to arrest Jesus? Jesus bends down, picks it up, puts it back on. And then they turn around and still arrested him. So there, those are five out of the six marks. The sixth mark is where Jesus raised the dead. 
And obviously that's, that's not mentioned here. Uh, but then finally Jesus would tell the man, uh, go to the priest and do what is according to the law. And that's going to be in Leviticus chapter 14, 1 through 20. Such a, a beautiful picture of Calvary in the Old Testament. Uh, the, the ceremony that was performed for lepers was basically if a leper felt they had been healed, they would come to the priest and the priest would give this thorough evaluation and then they would move through with the ceremony. And the very first thing that was done was two birds would be brought to the, um, to the altar. One of the two birds would be killed and its blood would be spilled and drained into a basin. They would also uh, apply a piece of cedar wood in the basin and then pour what into it? Anyone remember? Water. Water. Okay, so you had blood, cedar wood, water. Okay, then the living bird, they would dip into that mixture and set the bird free to fly. Now, what is that a picture of? Well, Christ is the ultimate sacrifice who shed his blood, and his blood cleansed from all sin, past, present, and future, broke the penalty of sin. The cedar wood obviously represents where that work was done, Calvary's cross. And then finally, the water is a representation of the Holy Spirit. Uh, when they stuck his side with a spear, the Bible says that blood mixed with water spilled out. So that's just a beautiful picture in the Old Testament of, of redemption. But now we can move into event 40. I didn't mean to take that much time uh, with the... Um, the, the background or what we already dealt with, but there was just a lot of good points I wanted to uh, rehearse. So now, uh, a few days later, we come to event 40. And if you remember, Jesus told the leper after he was healed, what did he say? Don't say anything about it. Don't tell anyone. It wasn't that Jesus didn't want people to know that, you know, he was healing, but it was the, the case where people would come out of the woodwork and prevent him from preaching the gospel by just flocking around him so closely. And remember, the primary focus of his ministry was preaching the gospel. It wasn't miracles. Miracles was just a byproduct of the gospel, which that's what it is today. Don't expect miracles without the gospel, right? right. You gotta have the gospel, then the miracles yeah. will flow. Amen. So his main concern was preaching the gospel, and he couldn't do that if, if crowds were coming out of the woodwork. But nonetheless, this man, he can't contain his excitement and truth be told, neither could we if it was us. If we had leprosy covered head to toe and, and Jesus healed us, well, we'd be saying something about it, right? Oh, yeah. So we can't blame the man. But nonetheless, the crowds come out, and that kind of forces Jesus into the wilderness for a few days. And the Bible says, what did he do there in the wilderness? He prayed. And that was really a big aspect of his life. If he wasn't preaching or discipling his followers, he was, he was praying. But now a few days later, he comes back. Look at verse 17. Luke chapter 5. By the way, this is event number 40. Jesus heals a paralytic or a man who was paralyzed. And it's paragraph chapter 5, Luke 5, 17 through 26. Uh, verse 17 says, And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law. These were mosaic lawyers, if you will sitting by which were come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Typically, Jesus only dealt with Pharisees whenever he would get closer to Jerusalem, okay? Because that's really where most of the, the Pharisees lived. And even during the first year or so, he really didn't see a lot of activity from the religious world. But now that his fame has, has gone abroad, Okay, Pharisees are coming out of the woodwork, religious people. And notice how they come out of Galilee, they came out of Judea, and even Jerusalem. Jesus is a long ways from Jerusalem. Remember, I just showed you Jerusalem is way down here, and Jesus is way up here. So it's pretty, it's pretty bad when you have religious people going out of their way, traveling days on end, just to minimize a person's ministry. That's really what it came down to. They went out of their way to try to demean or ridicule something about him because he was turning their whole world upside down. He was teaching things contrary to what they taught, so on and so forth. So, as we'll see, uh, Jesus comes to a certain house where he is now preaching the gospel. But before we move on, 
uh, it says that the power of the Lord was present to heal them. This refers to the anointing of the Spirit. Okay, Jesus, from the time he was baptized, when the, the Holy Spirit came down in the form of what? A dove. a dove and rested upon him from that moment forward as a man Jesus was commissioned and anointed by the Holy Spirit and just a few weeks prior to this if you recall when he was in his home hometown of Nazareth he's in the synagogue which was his custom every Saturday and and what did he what did he quote out of Isaiah and it's where he said or it's where Isaiah said the spirit of the Lord is upon me uh, he's anointed me to preach the uh, good tidings to the meek. He's uh, sent me to bind the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives, to the opening of prison to them that are bruised. And yet, once again, just a few weeks later, uh, we're told that the power of the Lord was still there, still on him. In fact, it would remain on him all the way up till Calvary. So he's he's ready to heal. Okay, he's preaching the gospel now that he's preached. Remember. Preaching comes first, gospel comes first, and then the byproduct of that is what? Yeah. Miracles. So now he's ready to heal. Look at verse 18. And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with the palsy. So this man was paralyzed. And from what we could tell, it wasn't just like a partial uh, paralytic. It was like from the neck down type situation. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went up on the housetop and they let him down through the tiling with his couch into the mist before Jesus. So again, typically Jesus, when it came to preaching indoors, it was only in the synagogues. Outside the synagogue, it was open air preaching. But now that the crowds are so massive, he, he really can't do that anymore. So now we see him resorting to households, people's homes that were large enough to, to have a large attendance. Uh, Mark's account on this in Mark chapter 2, and this is where you want to try to use all the Gospels together because every Gospel writer gives a little bit different account. Mark says that this place was packed, okay? It says straightway many uh, came and were gathered together inasmuch that there was no room to receive anyone else, not even at the door. So when they bring this man to this house, there's even people standing outside the door just trying to look in. So there is no way into this house. And again, Jesus has now taken uh, advantage of households because at least he can stand up on something, a table or whatever. Even though people's right up on him, at least he has a, the means to preach. Uh, Mark's gospel, again, and this is where you want to use all the gospels, Mark tells us there were four men that was assisting this man, okay? He had four friends, or some believe it was family members. Some will say it was possibly brothers. But either way, he had four men assisting him. And it says that they went up to the housetop and led him down through the tiling with his couch into the mist before Jesus. I personally believe if you want a best friend, look to Jesus. Okay, but second to him, look for someone who will point you to Jesus. A really good friend is one who will do whatever they have to do to get you to Jesus. Okay, that's a true friend. But the reason I say that the best friend is Jesus is because he stays closer than a brother. He's a friend that will never let you down. Even some of our greatest friend, Christian friends, they have flaws. Uh, they have inadequacies. They may let you down somewhere along the line. Jesus will never do that. Uh, you will never get in a debate or an argument with Jesus. If you do, you're wrong. He's right. <laughs> okay? But he's the best friend. Second to him uh, should be your spouse. If you're married, that's really your best friend. Second to Jesus. If you're not married, then look for someone who will always point you to him or do whatever it takes to get you to him like these men. We don't know how they did it, but somehow they strategized a way to carry this man to the rooftop, okay? This is dead weight. That's strong guys. Yeah, this is a paralyzed man. Anyone ever try to pick up a grown person off the ground that's just, even if they're not that big, dead weight is hard to lift. So to think that they're carrying him up on a roof by some means, 
but they don't stop there. They get him on the roof, and then they start tearing the tiles up. They start tearing the roof off the place and use some kind of ropes, maybe even sheets they tied into ropes, and somehow lowered him down. And it says that his couch was with him. His bed was with him. They put it all together, wrapped him up in the event that maybe if they dropped him, at least he had some padding. So they lowered him down, and he comes right down in front of Jesus. And look what Jesus says, verse 20. When he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, your sins are forgiven. Very first thing he said to the man. Doesn't say anything else, and no one has said anything. The man hasn't spoken. His friends are up on the roof. They haven't said anything, but they didn't have to. As soon as Jesus saw what was happening, he said, your sins are forgiven. Now, I want to show you something. There are some that will misinterpret this when it says, when he saw their faith. They will say this means he saw the four men's faith, and that's what enabled him to forgive this man. They were the mediators. Uh -uh. Okay, This is actually where Catholic theology will use to support how a priest can forgive you of sins. And here's the thing. The Bible teaches that flesh and blood can't forgive nothing, period. We're all lost. We're all in this thing together. So the proper interpretation is when it says when he saw their faith, he's speaking of all five. Luke, Luke's referring to the paralyzed man and his four friends. Okay, When he saw their faith, the very first thing he said was, man, thy sins are forgiven. And Notice again, no one says anything. They're not asking for anything, but that's the first thing Jesus says. He declares that this man's sins is forgiven, and he's able to do that because Jesus is not only man, he's also God. God. And as God, he can see into the heart of man. He can see the mind of man, and he can recognize if the heart has repented or if there is forgiveness that is desired. Jesus can see that. Uh, in other words, uh, Jesus not only saw the man's physical need, he saw his spiritual need first and dealt with that first and declared you are forgiven. But look what happens with the scribes and Pharisees. It says, they began to reason together saying, who is this that speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now here's the thing. These men were totally justified for being outraged. If Jesus was not God. Think about it. If Jesus wasn't God, they would have every right to sit back and call Jesus a heretic, a blasphemer, because technically only God can forgive sins. And yet here we are today, no one's outraged when we see people standing in the gap for Jesus declaring forgiveness of sins. Where's the outrage now? You ever thought about that? No one says anything about it now. But they are outraged that this man, they don't see him as God, they just see him as a man. They're outraged that he's declaring forgiveness of sin. But here's the thing, they really don't say it out loud, okay? They're saying it in here and up here. Uh, in Matthew's account, uh, Matthew gives the same account here in Matthew chapter 9. Matthew says that the scribes said it within themselves, okay? So they haven't said anything out loud. Jesus hasn't heard anything out loud, but he doesn't have to. He sees the heart. He knows the heart. And look what Jesus says in verse 22. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, see that? This is proof they didn't say it out loud. He answered them and said, what reason ye in your hearts? Or why are you reasoning this? Why are you calling me a blasphemer? And this alone should have been enough for them to believe he's God. Mm -hmm. Only God can reveal what your thoughts are, right? Mm -hmm. This should have been enough for them to really, truly wake up and realize God is standing in front of us. In John chapter 2, verse 25, that's the reference where Jesus said uh, that he did not need anyone to testify of him, for he knew what was in man. Jesus could look at someone a mile away and knew exactly who they were. He knew their heart, he knew their mind, because he had the ability to as God. And then he goes on to present the question. What is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, rise up and walk? 
In other words, which one's harder for Jesus to do? Forgive the sin or perform the miracle? Neither. Okay? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power upon the earth to forgive sins. And he said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto you, arise, take up your couch, and go into your house. So just as easy as it was for Jesus to say, man, your sins are forgiven, it was just as easy for Jesus to say, rise up, walk, and go to your own house. Leave this house and go to your own house. Now, I want to show you the order here. Very important. First, the man is forgiven before anything. You see that? That's very important. If you want God to work in your life and do things on behalf of you, you need to be like this man and have a repentant heart, have a, for, a, a, a desire to be forgiven. Now, that doesn't mean God will not reveal his grace and even heal lost people. He's done that in the Old Testament. Jesus healed the man who Peter cut his ear off, okay, just to reveal grace. Doesn't mean they died went to heaven just because he healed them, but it was to reveal grace. But if you want God to work on the inside and to continue bringing physical, emotional, mental uh, healing into your body, then there must be a repentant heart first. You must be saved. Then comes the miracle. So very important that we see uh, the, the order here. And then Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man. Son of Man. That's important also. What was that term? What, what did it mean? Anyone know? What son of man actually meant? It was a reference to his humanity. Okay, him being a man. God in the flesh. Uh, in Daniel chapter 7 verse 13, many, many years prior to this, the prophet Daniel prophesied and he actually saw the second coming of Christ in a vision. And he said, behold, I saw one like the son of man who came with the clouds of heaven and he came to the ancient of days. The Ancient of Days is the Father. The Son of Man is who? The Son. So Son of Man was a, a, a term uh, that Jesus would use to declare his humanity and how uh, it wasn't his deity that received humanity, but it was his humanity that received deity. Uh, the four gospel writers actually have a certain way of um, identifying Jesus. For, for instance, Matthew calls him the Christ. Over and over throughout Matthew's gospel, the Christ, which means Messiah or King. Whereas Mark says over and over, Jesus was the servant. So he's the king that came to serve. And then Luke uses the term son of man over and over. So he's the king that came to serve. Even though he was God, he still became born of flesh. And then finally, John declares that he was the son of God. So you put all four of them together, that, that's the, the true reality of Jesus. He's the king that came to serve. It was God manifested in flesh, and yet he contained deity all the way through. <clears throat> and Jesus, believe it or not, actually used Son of Man more than any other title, referring to himself. He used it 86 times throughout his ministry, or that's recorded in the Scripture. But look what it says, verse 25, and immediately, there's that, Instant healing again. See that? And immediately he arose up before them, and he took up that whereon he laid, and he departed his own house glorifying God. He was lowered from the roof and walked out the door. He's lowered from the roof, walked out the door. That would be a good sermon title. Lowered from the roof, and he walked out the door. So something else stood out to me here. All right, this man's paralyzed, doesn't walk, doesn't move his arms, and yet the moment he's healed, he gets up and takes off. That's a miracle within itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. To have the ability or the know-how to put one foot in front of the other, okay? That, that's within itself a miracle. Uh, and yet the sad reality of this, despite how dramatic this was, it didn't change anything with the Pharisees. Nothing. That's the blindness of religion, okay? When you don't allow something of this significance to pull the veil from your eyes, but you are just so bent. That's what religion does. It blinds. Uh, quickly, turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verses 37 and 38.
just to kind of give you a little bit more scriptural correlation. John 12, 37, 38. Amen when you're there. Amen. It says, but though he, Jesus, had done so many miracles before them, they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, and you'll find this in Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So the Old Testament already declared that the Messiah would do wonders, and yet it wasn't enough to break through religion. Religion is a horrible thing. To think that a paralyzed man from out of nowhere can just up and take off, and you don't see significance in that. You don't see Jesus as truly being God, you know, to still hold to your ideology that you're a blasphemer. That, that just goes beyond comprehension. But nonetheless, it did change hearts elsewhere. It says that they were all amazed. Go back to uh, Luke 5, 26. They were all amazed, the others, not the Pharisees, and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. And that word strange, it simply means remarkable. It's a Greek word meaning remarkable. And the fear that's mentioned here was actually the fear of God. In other words, they, these people now have a, a deeper sense of reverence to the things of God. When The more God works in your life, the more you recognize his holiness. The more you recognize how we are to uh, have reverence to his name. But that, that concludes that event. Now let's move into the next event. Event number 41, the call of Matthew, the tax collector, also known as Levi. This is verses 27 and 32. And I want to give you a good, uh, elaborate background concerning tax collectors because it's going to really help open up some things once we hit the scriptures. Uh, Matthew is no other than the author of the gospel that bears his name, the gospel of Matthew. Matthew, as a tax collector, had a very flourishing career, okay? Tax collectors made very well for multiple reasons. Uh, he had a very flourishing career, but it was a very corrupt career as well, very corrupt. Tax collectors were uh, very popular throughout the entire Roman Empire, and it was really the taxation that made Rome what it became. Rome was by far, out of all the empires you see in the Bible, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome was like the epicenter of empires. And it was mainly due to taxation and the way it would tax and all the different things that it would tax on. Uh, the taxation is what created all the roads. You've heard the common statement, all roads lead where? To Rome. Rome was known for its construction and development of roads uh, only because of the taxes. There was a tax collector stationed at every single intersection. Okay, You would pay a toll at every intersection. Rome also took up what was known as citizen taxes twice a year. And this was kind of likened to our real estate taxes. Here in Virginia, we, we pay what? Twice a year for real estate, unfortunately, and it's incredibly high, not mm -hmm. to mention the personal property and all the other stuff that we that we pay. But back then, uh, Rome would uh, declare a tax twice a year, and it was a very strategized system that kept track of every single person that lived in Rome. In fact, if you was Jewish, you would have to go to whatever district your ancestral line was from. Uh, for instance, I'll give you an example, Joseph and Mary. They were from the, you know, uh, they were of the seed of David, which was the tribe of Judah. Okay, well, the tribe of Judah, when the land was given out, the inheritance in the book of Joshua, that was the portion of where Bethlehem down here. So, Joseph and Mary living all the way up here in Nazareth. What do they have to do twice a year? Travel, Travel all the way down to Bethlehem. And pay their a very heavy tax, I might add. Um, if you was low class or middle class, you never could get ahead. There was no way to get ahead because you was constantly paying taxes. And we know that's how Jesus was ended up uh, ended up being born in Bethlehem. That they were there to pay their taxes. Uh, tax collectors were known as the dreads of society, 
and they were viewed to be the lowest of the low on both a moral and social scale, uh, and even symbolized the worst of sinners. Okay, keep that in mind. Uh, after all, no one really gets excited when the IRS sends you something in the mail, right? Yeah. You get something from the IRS, you don't get happy about it. Because usually it's, it's something in the negative sense. Very seldom do you get something from the IRS that says, we owe you money. Usually it's the other way around. So that's kind of how it was with, with tax collectors. Uh, they were absolutely hated by all of society. And to think that Jesus having thousands of candidates to choose from to be part of his little inner 12 he would choose a tax collector mm -hmm. think of that okay and we're going to see why um, virtually everything in rome was taxed okay and i'm going to give you a a list of the and, and I, there's a lot of other things that i'm not going to mention but these were the the core items that was taxed uh, number one we already mentioned it the road tax, or what we call toll taxes. Every major intersection, if you got on a new road, before you got on that road, you paid a toll tax to the tax collector. Uh, second to that is the merchant tax. If you was a merchant and you sold items, whether it was stuff that you made or whether you bought it off someone else and, and you tried to resell it, whatever the case, you were not only taxed on what you sold, but you were taxed on the location you were selling it from. Wherever you set up to, to sell your product, Rome wanted to add a tax to that location. So in other words, I'll give an example. Paul was a tent maker, right? Well, Paul, if he was honest, he would have to pay taxes on every single tent that he sold. Uh, number three, there was a land tax, and that's the one that they would pay twice a year. That was the heaviest tax. That one hit you hard twice a year, just like it does today. Number five, there was what was called a boat tax. If you owned a boat, once a year you got taxed on it, just like our personal property tax, okay? Not only would you get taxed on the boat once a year, you was taxed, uh, it was a small tax, but nonetheless it was a tax every, every time you took the boat out because every dock was owned by Rome. Okay, every body of water, all right, was owned by Rome. And so if you owned a boat, you had to pay a tax to keep it docked. And then every time you went to get in it, there would be a, a tax collector stationed at every single boat dock where you would have to pay a tax just to use your boat. And if that wasn't bad enough, if you came back with fish, you paid a fish tax on the amount of fish that you caught. So now let's put this together here. All right, we just learned that Peter, James, and John are fishermen, okay? We also were told that Peter owns a boat. So Peter doesn't think too highly of tax collectors, and rightly so. So I would imagine that the first couple of weeks was probably pretty uncomfortable hanging out with old Matthew. Think about that. This is a man who had been taxing them for their boat, their fish, everything, day after day. And Jesus walks up to the man and says, follow us. Can you imagine what the look on their face? Follow us. What, why do you want him to follow us? Of all people, Jesus, pick anyone but him. But there's a reason. Uh, on nights that you would go out and catch nothing, which was common, you had to pay a tax regardless, even if you came back with nothing. So you kind of went into the hole. Uh, Mark's account on this tells us that Matthew's booth was set up on the shore of Galilee. So not only was he collecting a tax on a, uh, a roadway, he was also collecting boat taxes and fish taxes. So he's hitting these disciples hard and has been for, excuse me, some time. So again, it would have taken some major adjusting for these other disciples to just accept Matthew as one of them. Uh, now I wanna give you four reasons Four main reasons why tax collectors were so hated. Number one was the obvious, they took your money, okay? Like every day, every, every little thing. He was constantly showing up to the tax collector. But it was even far worse for a Jewish tax collector, okay? If you was a Jewish tax collector, you was viewed as a traitor. You was viewed as someone who sold out to Rome 
and you were deemed by the, the religious spectrum as a, a lost Jew. They called you a lost Jew. They actually taught that if you was a Jew and became a tax collector, you were no longer part of the Abrahamic covenant. You were no longer declared a seed of Abraham. You're, you're just a sinner, not even Jew. So that was uh, reason number one, Jews were seen as traitors. Number two, tax collectors were very dishonest and were known to pocket a lot of the money that was turned in. Uh, Rome really had no way of knowing exactly what was being turned in if you didn't write down the transaction, right? If you didn't write the transaction down, well, you could just pocket basically whatever you wanted throughout the day. And so it is said that tax collectors would make more on the money they pocketed than what Rome paid them, and yet Rome paid them a very handsome salary. After all, not that many people desired to be tax collectors simply because of the animosity you would receive. So Rome had to make it worth their while to pay them very good. So not only are they getting a really good salary, but they're pocketing a lot of money as well. Um, number four, let's see, what did I give you, two? Oh, I'm sorry, number three, tax collectors were very corrupt. Uh, they were known as the politicians of biblical times without passing law. When you think of a politician, what do you think of? Right. Someone you can't trust, say, says one thing, does another, lies all the time. Well, that was your, that was your tax collectors, okay? Uh, they were people that were known to indulge in anything that was immoral. And what really, you know, added fuel to the fire, this is number four, probably the reason they're hated the most, tax collectors were given tax breaks. Imagine that. Okay. They were given tax breaks because of their, their employment. They were also given a lot of different luxuries from Rome, including free housing if they did not own their own estate. They were given free admission to many of the events that would take place in the Colosseums. And speaking of Colosseums, they also had access to front row seats, okay, without charge and a whole host of other things just to do Rome's dirty work. So now we begin to see it wasn't a good thing to be a tax collector, okay? You was the scum of the scum. And having considered all of that, that's what even makes it more amazing that Jesus would choose a tax collector to follow him. This was really just unconceivable. It was unconceivable to the scribes and Pharisees <coughs> that Jesus would have a tax collector hanging around, this rabbi, this so-called Messiah, if he's the Holy One of God, as the Old Testament declared him, why is he hanging out with tax collectors? Well, we'll see why. It was even unconceivable at first for his own disciples to fully understand what's going on here. But let's read it. It says in uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 27, it says, And after these things, and at, this was right after Jesus leaves the house, after he heals the paralyzed man, he went forth and he saw a publican. And a publican is just another word for tax collector, named Levi, sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said unto him, follow me. Now, some scholars allude to the idea that the reason why Jesus and his disciples even met Matthew is because they were paying taxes to him. That's how they crossed paths. Whether that was the case or not, Jesus says to Matthew the unthinkable, follow me. Since Jesus has spent the majority of his ministry in Capernaum, and we know this is where Matthew lives, according to verse 29, he, had, he actually owns his own house in Capernaum, Matthew would have been very familiar with Jesus. Okay, He would have been hearing about Jesus day after day. Can you imagine all the conversations he would overhear people say? as they stood in line to pay taxes, Jesus this, Jesus that, Jesus went there, Jesus came from there, uh, he healed this person, healed that person. And so Matthew, he's hearing all about Jesus, but here's the thing, there's really no point to even think about following Jesus. How come? Well, one, the crowd would have given him the cold shoulder in a heartbeat, okay? He would have just been seen as an outcast, 
No one would want him around. And then from his point of view, he's overhearing how Jesus can read minds and look into the heart of man. And from his point of view, if, if Jesus knows anything about my heart and what goes through my mind, he, he wants nothing to do with me. So even if Matthew wanted to follow Jesus, in his mind, it's pointless. Okay, I'm going to be shunned away. I'll be rejected, so on and so forth. Well, Matthew was in for a surprise. Because instead of going to Jesus and trying to follow him, Jesus comes to Matthew and says, follow me. Now, there's one more thing I want to give you about Matthew that made him different. Much different than just any Jewish tax collector. There was something that would make Matthew even more disgraceful. Anyone know what it is? There you go. Levi. If your name was Levi, that meant you was from the tribe of Levi. What was the tribe of Levi? Priest. Priestly tribe. Even if you was not an ordained priest, from society's point of view, if you're from the tribe of Levi, you still had to keep a certain standard because mm -hmm. you're from the priestly tribe, right? You, you still have to walk the straight and narrow way because you're from that, that holy priestly tribe, the, the tribe of Levi. And so for a person who is a, uh, a, uh, a Levite to go into the world of tax, that, that was just unheard of. And so there was even more disgrace added to Matthew. Uh, Matthew could only hear and see what was going on at a distance. And because of his background, he said, there's no way I'll ever be part of that. I'll never see Jesus in up close and personal. I'll never talk to him. I mean, he just lets the idea escape until the day came when Jesus said, follow me. And now we have an idea of why Matthew did what he did in verse 28. Look what it says. He left all. He rose up and he did what? He followed. He didn't have to think twice about it. He didn't consider anything Matthew actually leaves a very lucrative career behind. But here's the thing. Matthew understood, I want you to get this. He understood what does it profit a man to gain the world? Lose his soul. So Matthew understood that. He was ready to just say goodbye to the money, goodbye to all the benefits, and follow Jesus. So by now, we have Peter, James, John, and Matthew who has what? Left all. It, last week we seen where after they caught all those fish, Jesus said, you will now be fishers of men. And they just, they left it all behind. They, they stopped being fishermen. So now Matthew has stopped being uh, a tax collector. And look what it says in, in verse 29. This gets good. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and of all others that sat down with them. Matthew is so overwhelmed that Jesus would consider having him follow him on not just here and you know not just here and there but full time round the clock. This is a full time position. He's so overwhelmed that he goes home and he prepares a dinner banquet just for Jesus, but he invites look who he invites. Publicans. What is he thinking? Can't he just leave well enough alone and just have a nice little dinner for him and the, the disciples? And Jesus? Why does he have to invite a whole slew of publicans? Why? Well, first of all, two reasons. You've done nailed it on one. Two reasons. One, these were the only people he knew. He didn't know anybody that was not a tax collector. He didn't... He didn't jive with normal society because of his occupation. These were the only people he knew. And furthermore, in his mind, if Jesus is willing to ask me to follow him, there's hope for all of us. I'm bringing them all in. I'm bringing all my friends in. I'm telling every last one. Now, Luke is just being nice here, but Luke says that there was a great company of publicans and others. Luke's being nice about the others. Matthew, in his account, says they were sinners. Okay? So Matthew, understanding grace and having received grace, what does he do? He takes that grace and extends it to others. That's what we're called to do. Be witnesses yeah. of him. 
No wonder Jesus chose this guy. He knew all along, despite the man's past, he's going to be greatly used of me. And what do you know? Jesus shows up, no questions asked. He shows up, comes in, but guess who else wants to come? Scribes and Pharisees. But here's something before we get to that. Matthew's world has really changed. He goes from being immoral, corrupt, prideful, all those things, to becoming a man of pure humility. Now, why do I say that? All right. Here in Luke chapter 5, Luke makes it very clear this was Matthew's house, right? Yep. And if you go to Mark's account on this, Mark says the same thing. This was Levi's house. But in Matthew's own gospel, he doesn't even mention his own name. He just simply says, it says, it came to pass that Jesus said at meet in a house, and behold, there were many publicans and sinners there, and he sat down with his disciples. He doesn't even say, I'm the one that invited Jesus. He didn't say, this was my house. None of that. He even leaves out a little detail uh, where Luke tells us that he left all behind. Matthew doesn't even take us that route. He doesn't want us to know the sacrifice he made to follow Christ. He just wants us to know he follows Christ. That's it. He's not concerned with trying to get any honorable recognition or throwing a banquet. None of that. He, he is truly a changed man who is walking in humility. But then it says there were a great company of publicans and others that sat down and that said, these were the only people uh, that, that Matthew knew and, and could really invite himself. But then look at verse 30. Go figure, these guys have to show up as well. And no doubt these were uninvited guests, I might add. Okay, Matthew would not have invited these men. They just showed up unannounced. But the scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? See, this was the part where the, even the Pharisees were just, they could not concede. Why is Jesus, this so-called rabbi, this supposed Messiah, why is he in a house full of tax collectors? And I would say even at this point, his disciples, the disciples might be thinking the same thing. Why are we here? Why are we with all these heathens? And, and you know, there was probably some vowel language. Whenever you invite sinners to a place, you can expect sinners to be sinners, okay? And yet Jesus purposely came to this banquet. Now, here's something I want to show you. It says that they murmured, all right? The word murmured means a low tone whisper, okay? They're not saying anything real loud. They're, they're whispering. They're gossiping. And they're, they're throwing little hints at the disciples. In other words, Jesus is on one side of the house eating and drinking with sinners. On the other side is the disciples and then the, the Pharisees who's trying to give the disciples a hard time. Hey, hey, why do y'all eat and drink with sinners? Okay, and then from out of nowhere, from across the room, look at verse 31. They're whispering now. Jesus can't hear a thing, but he doesn't have to. He knows the heart. He knows the mind. Jesus blurts out, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. There's your answer. That's why we're eating and drinking with sinners. And then he goes on to say, and this would have been a straight up rebuke. Talk about some red faces. I came not to call the righteous, meaning self-righteous, but sinners to repentance. Mm -hmm. This passage of scripture, verses 31 and 32, I want you to write this little, these two verses down. These are the verses that you give to the person that says, I have to clean myself up before I can start coming to church. These are the verses that you give them. Because the reality of it is, you ain't cleaning anything up, period, Okay. And if you think about it, every last one of us was saved in our sin, right? Anyone stop being a sinner before Jesus saved you? No. no. If that was the case, what's, what good is salvation? No, he saved you in your sin. He saved you from sin. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He shows up in the midst of sinners 
in order to save them in the midst of their sin. Uh, here recently, I've been dealing with an individual that's been over the phone only, lives in a different state, and uh, he's an older man who wants, he, he's talking about salvation, said he'd like to be saved, but he can't because he's an alcoholic. And he says, I can't be saved until I stop drinking. I said, and I had to just get plain out blunt. And I said, well, good luck with that. That's not going to happen. And even if you was to stop drinking for any length of time, you will always have this mentality that you contributed to the work of God. I said, and, and furthermore, you don't have it within you to change anything about you. Even if you stop putting the bottle to your mouth, it's that, that desire is still on the inside. Okay, that doesn't change. And, and then I went on to give him an example. No one who is sick waits until they start feeling better before they go to the hospital. Right? right? Anyone just sits around and feels miserable and says, well, I'll wait until I feel a little bit better, then I'll go. Well, what good is that? No, you go to the hospital because you're sick, because you need help. And that's what it is with all sinners. They are in need of uh, in need of help. And Jesus boldly declares, yells across the room even, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. And I came not to call the, the righteous or the self-righteous, but sinners to repentance. And I think this would have really been an eye-opener. For the disciples alone. I think it was at this moment where there was a turning point that Peter, James, and John truly began to realize the incredible grace of God that is for all walks of life, no matter who they are, where they come from. And I'll close with this. In Luke chapter 15, that's where we have these three back-to-back -back parables. It's one whole sermon. The lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. Okay, Jesus nails all three one after the next. But if you go to the beginning of that chapter, it says that he was speaking to two classes of people, scribes and Pharisees, publicans and sinners. And who was the group up close and personal? The sinners, the publicans. And every parable was designed for that audience. The lost sheep was the publicans and sinners. And Jesus said, when one comes to repentance, there's more rejoicing than 99 self-righteous. Then in the lost coin, he says the same thing. And then finally, the lost son, that really hit home. The lost son was a picture of the, the publicans and the sinners. And the older brother that got upset for the son's return was who? The Pharisees. And the story doesn't end. The story just closes out. But there is a true ending to that story. That's the ending we find with Jesus. The brother kills the father at the end of that story. That's really what, what happened when it was all said and done. Because that's exactly what happened to Jesus, was it not? The yeah. Pharisees did what? Killed Jesus. So I just wanted to give you that as a, a tie-in there at the end. Uh, next week we'll move into event number, is it 42? Yep. Event number 42, um, and in Luke chapter 6 is where we're going to see the, the fulfillment of all 12 disciples becoming apostles. Up to this point, they're just kind of, they're, they're there, but not all of them are there. Uh, some of these disciples, like uh, Bartholomew and even Simon the Zealot, we don't know where they come in the picture, how Jesus met them, there's no record of that. Uh, but we'll probably get into that sometime, uh, maybe next week or the week after. Uh, any comments, questions? Dodie? So far as it, um, you're talking about the, the journey that they had to make twice a year, how far was that in mileage? Uh, I think it was three days' journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem mm -hmm. uh, on foot or on a donkey. I think it was. Th I think it was three. So the average, and, and that's the thing, people back then would cover a lot of ground. The average day's journey consisted of 15 to 18 miles. So I would say 15, 30, 50 miles, thereabout, something like that. Not, not a fun journey for someone nine months pregnant. Paul? Uh, when you were talking about Romans, Texas, I think I listened to number four. 
Okay. All right. The first one, uh, let me go back here. Road tax, merchant tax, land tax, and then there was number four in there. All right, we got the toll tax, merchant tax, land tax. Li I'm sorry, I forgot to give it. That's why you missed it. Livestock tax. Live, and here's, here's, I'm glad you mentioned that. Grown tax due on every species of animal. If you had cows, you paid a cow tax. If you had horses, you paid a horse tax, pigs, chickens, okay? So now we begin to really see the burden of Rome. And when Jesus came, he came during a time when people were just so burdened with, I mean, you never could get ahead. Uh, you could work seven days a week, but every time you turned around, you, you was being taxed. And that's why Rome was able to be the only empire to build the Colosseums. Uh, they had running water. They actually had channels that had running water throughout the empire. But all that was done primarily two things, slavery. Rome had the biggest slavery. Uh, slavery trade and all other empires combined, and the taxation. So Jesus came in a time when the world needed him more than ever at that time. Now we need him more than ever, yeah. period. Mm -hmm. Sounds like Rome is the United States. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. Yeah, well, it's taxes. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's only going to get worse before it gets better. Mm -hmm. All right, anyone else before we close out tonight? All right, well... Hopefully we'll see everyone uh, Sunday morning. Father, we thank you again for giving us this time of study and a, a word. We ask that you will just help us to take this word, uh, allow it to just dwell richly within us. Lead God and direct us in all that we do and bring us back at your appointed time. Keep us all safe and covered in your grace. And we ask this in Jesus' name and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Amen.